We thought it would be interesting uh, as we are having a conference here in Silicon Valley to talk to uh, the CIOs of a couple of, of key technology firms and do so with an eye towards understanding what it's like to be the head of the technology function in organizations where technology is so key. Um, and I, I've had a conversation with each of you about this topic uh, and you've both said sort of a similar thing that you work in organizations where you're surrounded by people who feel like they could do your job better than you can. Um, and Atticus, I wanted to begin with you. You had a really interesting nuance to this. So you've been at uh, Intuit for about 14 years. Right. And you've had engineering roles, you've had product roles, you've had other roles as well, but relatively new to IT. Uh, that, that is, this is your most recent post. You didn't grow within, up within the IT function. And in fact, you were one of those people that felt like, yeah, you know, it's, it's, how big a deal is this job, right? Exactly. And you'd heard a lot of complaining, you'd heard a lot of uh, you know, sort of the issues that IT had, but you went the extra step and said, you know what, why don't I go uh, see what I can do? Why don't I be part of the solution if in fact that's the case? So I wanted to begin there. First of all, and the other thing that you said recently when we spoke was, now that you're on this side of the fence, you feel like most, uh, most people could do a portion of your job, but probably not all of it. And I wanted to begin there. Can you right. explain what, you're, you're, what you meant by that? Sure. Um, it, it, yeah, and, and I think you know when I was in um, engineering for the small business group, you know the biggest frustration I had was really trying to get some of our marketing pages out, uh, and so that was kind of what I thought is, hey, how hard could that be? And then when I went over to IT, as as uh, Peter was saying, um, I found out there's just a myriad of problems, and as all of you know you have to manage every single legacy system that came before you perfectly. If you have any, even one customer on that system, it has to operate perfectly while you're building out the grand new world with everything as a service and all of this and moving everybody off. And the hardest part about that is not really the technology, it's the change management journey. It's getting people to change their business processes. It's getting people to take the risk to move on to the, to the new system. Uh, and so my view is, you know, anybody in marketing thinks they can do marketing technology better than I can. Or anybody in finance thinks they can pick, go out and pick a billing system better than I can. But the hard part about being the CIO is you have to do all of those things in balance with limited budget, looking at the strategy of the company, and you have to make the right decisions always for all of those things. So that's kind of what I meant by that, is you're balancing. Yes, exactly. And actually, it's a great, great segue to something I wanted to cover with you, Ben. You've talked about, I mean, you've been with uh, Google now for eight years, roughly. Almost, yeah. Almost eight, eight years, uh, after about 14 years with Morgan Stanley. Um, actually, congratulations to, to in, in, in an area of the country where people are known to be so professionally promiscuous going from company to company to company. It's great to see some long-standing technology executives here. Um, ben, one of the things that you've said is, in fact, that... Uh, making change a core competency is really integral to being a successful CIO and especially to being a successful CIO within a technology company. Can you, can you talk a bit about that? Sure, so uh, you know, when you get to first principles, I think we all have to acknowledge that people are creatures of habit, right? Human beings are creatures of habit. We're all human beings. The people who we support, the work that we do is all on behalf of people who form habits. Yet at the same time, uh, our departments, our disciplines, are masters of the fastest moving endeavor in the history of the enterprise, that is technology and computing, which puts, makes us the meat in a very strange sandwich, right? You have creatures of habit on the one hand and an incredibly quickly moving discipline on the other. And uh, you know what I've seen is it becomes all too easy, I think, not to recognize that that is in fact the core of the nature of the problem because it is the core of the nature of the problem, the thing that we have to do is embrace change and be great at change, right? If our enterprises can't keep up with the changing nature of technology, we lose opportunities for advantage, right? And no one wants to be in the situation of you know, running the ERP system that's so old the manufacturer won't support it anymore or something like that. That's an extreme that we all understand. But the reality is, in fact, just on a day-to-day -day basis, we have to help our users make change. So one of the ways I think about this is that um, if you take the most um, common function in IT, the help desk, right? It's all too often people see your help desk as a place to save money and a place where you want to have recipes and repeatability and FAQs that people in low cost locations can read back to your users. But if you're doing that, what you're actually saying is you value the habit more than the ability to change. And actually our approach, the thing that I've seen that actually works very well is to hire generalists with deep technology skills who don't need an FAQ and don't need a recipe and can, from their own skills and experience, figure out the user's problems. And when you do that, you can change very, very 
rapidly. You know, at one point due to due to externalities, you know, we changed our complete remote access infrastructure in three days for you know 30,000 plus people. You could never do that if you needed to wait for the elevator hallway posters and the FAQs and the coming soon signs <laughs> and so on before before you rolled out uh, a big new change. Mm. Uh, Atticus, returning to your point about being on both sides of the table, being a user of IT, now running IT, as you now interact with your colleagues with whom you used to uh, share so much in common as users of IT, now understanding all that you do as you described, from a communication perspective, what's changed? You, you have a degree of empathy for them, I, I assume, because you've sat in so many other chairs. What, what, how do you now think about communicating progress and communicating strategically with your colleagues as a result of that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the most important things the CIO or anybody in a technical organization to do, can do is learn how to speak business, mm -hmm. uh, how to work with business colleagues to understand how technology isn't just enabling the strategy, but how technology is now part of the business strategy. It's core to succeeding. And so speaking in a language that's about business and business outcomes with technology is core to that and how those are work together is, is the most important thing I think I do as a CIO. Mm -hmm. And I also, as someone who spent time in product, you're starting to think more of IT like a product area and trying to adopt some of those uh, aspects of what worked well within the product area. Can you talk a bit about that trend? Sure, absolutely. A couple things we did. One is I reorganized IT. It used to be really around systems. And, and a team was a Siebel team, or they were the BRM team, or they were the uh, Salesforce team. And instead, we're now organized really around customer segments. So I have one team focused all on sales, care, commerce, and marketing technology. And they together think about how they enable that conversation with our customers through whatever the latest technology is. Because whatever's hot today is not going to be hot three years from now, and I don't want people getting tied to that technology. Uh, same thing around financials, same things around workforce technology. Uh, but what we also have done is we've created the discipline of product manager inside of IT which is sort of like a business analyst, but really, again, thinking about those business outcomes, you know, grooming the backlogs, working with the Agile Scrum teams uh, in IT. You know, we've switched over to full uh, Agile as well. The other thing I've done is created a, a design team within IT. I have researchers, I have user experience designers. We go out and sit and watch agents who use the technology, and we do what we call a follow me home, which is something we do for our products, but where we go actually watch agents work we watch the general workforce work, and we look at ways to improve how they're working. So we really think of ourselves just like any other product team, which also helps us be a first-class citizen at the table. Because the other thing that's happening is the line between what a product team builds and what IT builds is blurring. Uh, we're all building microservices. I'm, I'm in the middle of turning all of IT into a set of microservices that product teams can call. Uh, we have to be able to be running at the same speed as those teams and using the same kind of language and same kind of uh, methodology. Yeah. Ben, uh, you've talked about the need to, for uh, CIOs to move increasing amounts of investment from infrastructure to application development. That part of the role of CIO in facilitating innovation and helping drive some of the change that you've described means setting up an organization and all that it manages towards flexibility. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about a bit about how you've done that at Google? Sure. Well, I think it starts, I'd, I like to... Uh, I was happy to agree with my former colleague Dennis in the previous panel who said that the value is in the user layer, right? And I think in IT, that is so, so, so true. It's even as, just as true in IT as it is in any product area that you might have. And uh, yet we can forget that because uh, infrastructure is something that every technology department at one point had to master, and then you become good at it, and you don't want to let it go. But uh, the truth is, is that technology uh, like a biological imperative, we need to evolve. And uh, you don't actually need to do these things anymore. Cloud offerings are great for an awful lot of these things. And the more investment that you can make as a technology department in the user layer, in products and services that your users actually seek and value in their presence, the better you do. Infrastructure is an enabler, and it tends to only be valued in its absence when it breaks, right? And although there are certainly things that meet that tests that you must continue to do, you need to take a very hard look at them. I would much rather uh, pay on an elastic basis for someone to operate my infrastructure, which is more or less what I've been able to do within Google, than I would have to worry about all those disciplines myself. To the point of the first question you asked uh, Atticus, you know, my department is probably the most diverse in engineering at Google. There are 27 different job functions, job ladders in my organization. 
hmm. right? And so the more I can do to narrow our focus and uh, reduce that, the better. I was going to ask actually both of you how much, uh, perhaps more so for you, Ben, as somebody who's been enrolled longer, how the org structure of, of IT and the skill sets of IT have changed across, in your case, nearly eight years. What sorts of skills are more in demand today than they were five years ago or emerging as uh, incredibly important? And what are some of the ones that perhaps are starting to fade away? So over the long term, over the long run, the best investment continues to be in great computer science and software engineering skills. If you actually want to do the most at that user layer, if you want to give your company a competitive advantage or cultural advantage or differentiation, you need to build things. And you do that with software engineers and people with training in computer science. But I've seen lots of other skills emerge and some decline. You know, honestly, our, for example, uh, like Atticus, again, I've built, uh, my, uh, my team has built a really powerful user experience team with designers and with researchers. And uh, actually having people who can uh, make our products have the user experience of a product is a fantastic differentiator. You know, we have in IT, we tend to have all these constraints that the product teams don't have, which makes the user experience investment all the more important. I mean, one thing that we wrestle with that's a real, here's a real software engineering challenge where the user experience people can help, for example, is you only do compensation planning a couple times a year, at least at, at Google. Uh, and we have a whole bunch of, we have a, some unique ways of thinking about how you do compensation planning, and therefore we have built some powerful systems to do it. But you only get two drops a year, right? You only get two chances a year to get this right. There, you can't really launch and iterate on the compensation planning system. You get two iteration cycles, and so deep investment in user experience mm -hmm. helps a lot. Atticus, you mentioned product managers as one of the areas that you're investing in, for instance. Are there other uh, roles that are emerging within IT that are a reflection of the change that you've just described? You know, it, it, product managers, obviously, but one role that I, is not really an emerging role, but it's a highly evolving role, at least in Intuit, is architecture. Hmm. Uh, you know, the role of both an enterprise architect as well as what's, I think, typically known as a solutioning architect and how those work together. Uh, enterprise architecture is much more important than it ever was mm -hmm. uh, as we start to adopt, you know, more offerings and how we at the center adopt core offerings for the company but allow groups like marketing or sales to experiment with things safely. How you architect that system end to end, thinking about scalability, security, uh, data movement. Uh, it, I think it's an evolving role and one of the most important roles. Mm -hmm. yeah, I recently did an interview with Ron Ross from NIST and he was talking about EA as one of the, perhaps the number one way to secure the enterprise. The enterprise architecture and security are so tightly bound because of its, as a mechanism of organizing your technology, simplifying your technology, continuing to stay on top of that. Uh, as we're talking about people though, obviously there's a tremendous war for talent, uh, perhaps felt no more uh, in, in any area than where we're sitting now, uh, not just Half Moon Bay, but the more general um, area around us. Um, <laughs> And, and I wonder what methods the two of you use, as you both have talked about the, the sanctity of getting great people, that it is sacrosanct in order to, to ensure that you are doing uh, all that you need to from an IT perspective. What are some of the methods that you've used uh, in order to attract uh, and retain great talent? I'll begin with you, Ben. Well, obviously, it depends on the sort of talent that you want to attract, the kinds of problems that you expect them to solve. But the first and most important thing is, especially when you're inside a technology company and you're hiring technologists, is you need to have a laser focus on mission and on the value that these people add. And then I think the case becomes about uh, helping candidates, finding candidates who appreciate the intersection of the problem and their own, their, their training in computer science or engineering or what have you. But what tends to work well is you know, people who understand and appreciate the way in which the products that they build on my teams can turn into force multipliers for the company, mm. right? And if they, when they really believe in the mission of the company and they believe in the problems perhaps of a department or of the entire company and they understand the impact that they'll get to see, I think that that's important. Then the other thing that goes with that almost without saying is you have to have great engineering problems for them to work on. Right? So uh, if you have great challenges that will expand their skills and give them the opportunity to try new things, while at the same time increasing their impact on the business, you've got a, good, you've got a great chance in, in that war for talent. And if you haven't put that kind of thought into it, mm -hmm. it's going to be much harder to make a case. Yep. 
Addicts, any uh, thoughts? I, I agree with everything Ben said, and, and would just underscore for IT that, that uh, point around mission, I think, is so clear because as an IT group, it's easy to think about how many tickets you've processed or you know, how many backups you've run uh, when none of that really matters. It is really all about the mission. And, and I think one of the hardest things is for some of those teams that are in a little bit more of a pedestrian um, role or they're s supporting legacy technology, how do you still give them that mission? Uh, mm -hmm. But we strive to do that with every single team. Yeah. Uh, because they, if you don't have a sense of mission, it's really hard to be self-directed as a team. And that's the other part, is it has to be self-directed. Um, the other, I would just also underline, uh, you have to have hard problems to solve. Uh, and and um, I guarantee every one of you does. Uh, and so you have to make sure you keep looking about how you frame that as what the folks are working on. Yeah, I want to open it up for questions. The microphones will begin to come around in a moment. Uh, so if you could prime those, I uh, would love to hear from all of you as well. <clears throat> I'd love to understand from, from both of you, you as, as, uh, as has been the theme of the conversation, you obviously work within very tech-centric organizations. Uh, and I don't get the sense that either of you are, are uh, pining for some role outside of your company. Um, note to the, our friends at Corn Ferry, at least for the moment. Um, but if you were to, from the experiences that you have, um, you have had in these organizations, if you could you know, offer advice, I suppose is the more elegant way to put it, to your peers in non-tech-centric organizations and thinking about the experiences that they have, what would you do were you to find yourself in a role like that? Or what advice would you offer as a result of those things? things, uh, the experiences that you've had in a tech-centric organization? You know, I guess maybe a, a couple things. Yeah. Um, one is um, be an educator of the rest of the C-suite on technology. Mm. Uh, don't be the only technologist on that staff. It's a losing place to be. Uh, make sure everybody, you raise the tech savvy everywhere, uh, but help make sure you have a clear mission around your technology uh, for the company. That would be one thing. Mm -hmm. That's great. Ben, would you... Uh... Yeah, I got a, a few, and first of all, I think, Atticus, that, that's spot on. It's easy for me to even take that for granted because most of the, my peers at Google seem to have PhDs in computer science. <laughs> so, but um, I th I, there's a few things that, uh, pieces of advice I would give or things I would put in, in the playbook. First is make sure my people are to the greatest possible degree all working on problems that can uh, differentiate the enterprise, either competitively or culturally, and that everything else I am hopefully pushing out to the cloud or, or software as a service and other sorts of providers. People are only working on our most important problems where they can see their impact. Number two, I would go and make sure that the rest of the C-suite and the board supported the idea that there were important problems that needed to be solved with advanced engineering and computer science. And number three, I would go out and build and galvanize a team around that mission and with that support to go out and solve those problems. One last thing I would add maybe is just again, think of technology as a democratizing force uh, inside yeah. the organization. Absolutely. How do you get radical transparency for the information? You know, how do you help empower you know, if you're a large geographically distributed organization, how do you get information out to the leaf nodes so people can be making decisions locally but in context? Uh, so think of things like that because I think that is one of their unique roles still of IT. And, and thank you for pointing that out because I talk about cultural differentiation a lot, but uh, maybe you have to be me to understand what that means. But those are great examples of it, right? Helping the organization. I mean, at Google, in the same way, transparency is very, very important to us, right? And we built a lot of technology just purely for the purpose of creating transparency about the inner workings of the company so that everyone can be a great decision maker on behalf of the company. And I think if you do that really, really well, you actually really create a much more efficient and much leaner organization overall. That's something only you can only do from inside. And only yeah, IT exactly. Can do. With that, we, looks like we have a question over here. Um, Atticus, coming from the engineering side now in IT, IT obviously is usually responsible for security. How or what advice would you give us on how to win over the engineers around security and balancing securing the corporation and ease of use because we're typically cornered as being Mr. No. Um, so how would you suggest we, we, we navigate that to win the engineers over that we need to secure the corporation right or sure. correctly? 
Yeah, I mean, a, a couple of thoughts. I, I think uh, security is obviously always got to be number one in our minds with everything we're doing, especially in today's evolving world. And, and I would argue that a more secure product is actually an easier to use product. Uh, and, and it's not really an either or. It's you have to design it in. Uh, and it has to become part of how you think about your product uh, and how you think about how you operate within the company. Uh, and it, it just, it, it, there's no, um, there's really no way around thinking through security in, in everything you do. Um, the, other, the other thought is, how, back to when something Ben said earlier, how do you think of it as a grand challenge? How do you think of it as a true engineering problem to solve, which is how do you have as much security as you can, because it's never enough, but as much as you can, while also having the best experience possible. That's an interesting challenge uh, you know, that we at Intuit are facing every day. You know, we, we continue to add security features and think about security from, from day one on all of our products, and yet I think our products are still some of the easiest to use. Uh, and so that's what I would say. I don't know, Ben, if you have. Uh, well, I think you nailed it in a lot of ways, and I, I think that in fact, people often miss on, so the idea of usability and security being uh, opposite sides of the same axis is a misapprehension, right? Great security has to be usable because if it's not usable, it won't be used and you won't have great security. That's the great challenge to security researchers and that, that part of the industry. And we've seen, uh, I mean, honestly, I think that things like there's products like the uh, uh, security key, which uh, a technology that a consortium led by PayPal and Google and a number of other companies have participated in gives you two-factor authentication, for example, that's far, far easier to use than the big clunky cards we used to have, right? So it's possible to improve security while at the same time making it easier to use. And I think one of the jobs of the CIO is to, you gotta get in the middle and make it clear to everyone that it's not, it's not us against them, it's not usability or features against security. That is uh, an attribution error. Mm -hmm. Question here, Ralph. So, um you both touched on this idea. There's an um, executive coach, an, an author named um, Marshall Goldsmith, who has a book out called uh, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Yeah. And uh, it's probably one of the most common pieces of advice I give to you know, my IT leaders or, or peers. You know, Atticus talked about refactoring all of IT around containers. Ben, you talked about infrastructure to apps, to user experience. Um, so clearly, to, to be a long-tenured CIO in a company uh, and companies is challenging uh, is yours, it requires constant refactoring and reinvention. So how do you think about that? How do you make sure the, the, what, you know, the, the next step, the reinventing yourself and your organization is moving the needle forward and you're not sort of chasing the latest buzzy, fuzzy trend? So, well, <laughs> uh, that, thanks Ralph, great question. Um, <laughs> Softball think, for you, Ben. Yeah, well, I, I think first of all, uh, if no matter what field you're in, I think one of the hallmarks of, of a professional is dedication to self-improvement. So uh, if you're doing it right, you've been working on yourself your entire life, and hopefully that by the time you get to this job, that's enough context that you can try to separate out a little bit, you know, fad from function. Um, I think that there are, you know, there are a number of other parts of the answer to your question that really depend a lot on context. What are the universals in what we do? It really is an ability to self-educate. It's an ability to look out to the long term. I think that uh, uh, being a great CIO does also require that you be a very, very good, if not great, manager. And that requires understanding, I think, the long term as well. It's easy to make decisions about the latest fad and so on and try to win over a few hearts and minds because you're doing something that was written up on Hacker News yesterday. But the reality of it is the decisions that we make can live for five or 10 years in our enterprises and you have to have a view as to what that kind of impact is and what that means. A Couple things to add to that. I mean, what you said is exactly why I love this job. Because uh, every day I wake up and it's a little bit different. Uh, every day I wake up and think I'm a little bit dumber and a little bit smarter at the same time. Because uh, I will tell you, when I, when I first came over to IT, I really did think, oh, how hard can this be? It really is, I think, one of the hardest jobs in the company. Uh, because you are straddling that technology business um, uh, divide and you're trying to make it not a divide. Um, but, the, but the other thing is, um, I think the thing I always try to keep in mind is, am I leaving things in a better state than I found them for the person who's after me? Because I don't really think I own any technology in the company, I'm just a steward. 
Uh, and I think that's part of our culture at Intuit as well. We always try to do that. And I think if, you, if you're thinking about that, you're going to be a little less likely to chase the current fad. Uh, but you still have to investigate them all, and you have to see what's out there, and you have to come up with ways that your organization can experiment with them and learn. Uh, and find out what's real for you. Because it also isn't necessarily just hype. It may not be the right technology for your company. Yeah. Uh, and you don't know that unless you try it. And it strikes me, actually, the two of you, as people who've been with your companies at least for some time, you've had reason to think about the long term and think about the impl implications of the decisions that you're making, not as something that you're going to leave behind in a year and a half or something like that, but something that perhaps you will continue to shepherd uh, you know, for, for the medium or long term as well. That certainly would offer a different perspective, I would think. Other yes, I, I live with all my bad decisions every day. So, yeah. <laughs> Other questions? There's one over here. Yes. Um, just really quickly, at first, uh, you guys did a wonderful job um, leading you know, tech companies from the IT side. Uh, but most companies don't grow up that way. Uh, they, haven't, they have long traditions and... And you talked about tech savviness uh, for all the leaders, which I really, really do believe in. Um, and you've woken us up. I mean, there is the rise of unconventional competitors today um, all over the place. And you know, when you're a traditional company, it's startups and it's tech companies like you guys, we're seeing what's keeping you guys up now? What are you paranoid about? Because we, certainly have, we have certainly figured out that the Alibabas of the world uh, are a threat to most traditional companies today. What keeps you guys up? Who'd like to talk about their sleep patterns uh, yeah, first? Well, <laughs> not much keeps me up. If I, if I couldn't sleep, I'd die. So, um, but I, I, there are a few things. So one thing that I'm, it's a happy problem. I almost uh, uh, hesitate to mention it, but over eight years now at Google, uh, one of the things that's kept me up and I realize is one of the things you need to think in a very forward way about is dealing with growth, right? So I, I had a great career at Morgan Stanley on Wall Street and that was not a growing industry at the time that I left. So I feel a bit of survivor's guilt in saying this, but uh, you know, the compounding effects of significant double digit growth over my eight years have uh, taught me an awful lot about, some of it is about the points that Atticus made about how you have to shape an organization so it'll be stronger in the future. But in general, the growth problems are some of the biggest and hardest, because it's not just my department's growth is the least of it, how to keep that under control and make us be an over more shrinking kind of piece of the cost puzzle and more piece of the value puzzle. But keeping up with a company that grows across every possible dimension has been a really hard thing. Uh, I mean, I think the gimme is that every CIO has to talk about security as well, right? Because you can never do, you can never do enough. And the hardest part of security is actually figuring out what that balancing act is and understanding if you're taking the right kind of risk management approach. Yeah, the, the things I'll add to that, I think the two things that keep me up in, in addition to uh, everything he said is um, speed. Are we going too fast or, or are we going fast enough? Because yeah. there is a right speed. Uh, and so I wonder about that. If you go too fast, you lose your folks. Uh, and if you don't go fast enough, obviously you lose your business. Uh, the, the second is talent. Uh, you know, do I have the right talent for where we are right now? And am I doing everything I can do to make sure they are the right talent? Yeah. And I would, I completely agree with those points. And I would add that I also spend a lot of time worrying, am I doing enough for the talent in my organization? Exactly. Right. Are we being, as a manager, as a leader, you are trusted to be the steward of the career of the people who work for you. And are you executing on that, you know, as well as you possibly can? Mm -hmm. There was another question over here. Yes. Yeah. Um, both Google and Intuit are some of the most innovative engineering organizations out there. Uh, I'm interested from especially Ben, uh, how is IT organized as a management structure and how uh, are, are the relationships with the engineering and how do you support engineering organizations? Okay, uh, well that was specific. So. Um, <laughs> How is IT organized? I, I'd say conceptually, uh, we have um, you know a few major components. Uh, you know, there's there's uh, operations, which we call site reliability engineering. There's uh, a variety of applications and services that are strongly aligned with a particular user group, uh, like finance or marketing or sales or legal or uh, facilities or, and 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 so on. Um, there's uh, 
product management, which we kind of see as a discipline unto itself, that product managers end up being matrixed into the application development groups that they support. And then there's a large set of user-facing services, which is personal computing and mobile phones and help desk and you know, video conferencing and, and so on. Now I have to say that you know, I could show you my org chart, uh, which kind of sounds like what you asked me to do, but um, you know, it's very, very much tied to the context of Google and what works at Google in 2016. I, I, it's not meant to be, the thinking might be helpful, but the, the org chart itself isn't a blueprint that you can use. In terms of how we work with other product areas, uh, you know, you get to, at Google, you know, you get to a certain level. I'm sure this is true at any company. And most of my job is partnering, influencing with, you know, what I personally spend my time on is collaborations with any number of teams, the cloud team, the identity team, the uh, Android team, you know, the Google for Work team. It's all about, uh, I think, as a leader in a tech company, uh, you have to do a lot of partnering and influencing with peers on the product side and the engineering side for a variety of reasons, right? But that's where I end up spending my time. Hmm. Ben, there was a, forgive me, I'm forgetting the term, but I wonder if you could share a brief anecdote that you shared with me the last time we were um, together about, is it obsolescence days? Uh, bureaucracy busters? Bureaucracy exactly. busters, there you go, exactly. You had this great story about this practice within Google of, of identifying and destroying a, a bureaucracy yeah. where, wherever people find it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, so we're a very uh, kind of bottoms up company. And so one of the things that we do is put out a poll. Uh, traditionally, we've done this every year. Put out a poll every year. And uh, in most years in the past, uh, the CFO was the sponsor of the poll, but the goal was just uh, it's a, a write-in poll, write in the things that you consider to be the most annoying pieces of bureaucracy in the company. And the poll is open for a, a couple weeks, and then actually a, a dedicated team spends a lot of time going through it and trying to turn that into action, into action items. And it's for any organization that has any part of anything that might be considered, you'd be surprised what gets called bureaucracy, right? Have to walk too far to get the plastic forks in the cafeteria or, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, so, but it, it is, it's, uh, that's one of these examples of transparency and leadership accountability that's fantastic. And that turns into an entire work stream for my department, for, for my team. It doesn't affect everything that we do, but, you know, I. The way I think about it is actually to tie back to this question of organization and part that I didn't answer, the most, often the most impactful things we can do as CIOs is the work on behalf of groups that don't have a business department to support them, right? What are all the technology needs of everyone in the company? There's no one to speak for them generally and bureaucracy busters often ends up being great fodder for new products that we should develop that can serve the entire company and things we can do to make the company more efficient. And now the big challenge for us is can we turn that into an ongoing thing that we do constantly or is it best just kept done a few times a year? Yeah. I think it's one of the great things about companies like these two, incredibly fast growing leaders in the technology space and yet still trying to hold dear those things that were part of its DNA from the, from the get go. And I think it's a, a great example of that. Uh, won't you all join me in thanking Ben Freed and Atticus Tyson.